This is the official We Own This City podcast from HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Do you guys know who I am? Please, let me see your hands on the ground. Get down on the ground. Everything changed when they came up with that expression, the war on drugs. They put me in a unit made up of a bunch of the biggest crooks in the whole goddamn department. Jackpot, motherfuckers. Senor Pablo Escobar is the police. There's always a rumor of a federal investigation. This shit never happens. It's Baltimore. The drug war justifies a lot. I'm not a dirty cop. Long story. A lot of twists. I'm Dee Watkins, the host of this podcast and writer on HBO's We Own This City, a series from George Pelicanos and David Simon on corruption and abuse within the Baltimore Police Department. This show is personal for me, not just because I was a part of the writer's room, but also because I have experienced extremely violent run-ins with some of the actual police officers we portray in the series. Over the next six episodes, I'm going to share my experience in and out of the writer's room I'll also be joined by the people who brought this story to the screen. So how did I go from the streets to an HBO writer's room? Let's go back to the beginning, which I wrote about in Salon. Over a decade ago, I saw a woman named Ronnie get slapped across the face by a man named Kelly a dusty crack dealer with zigzag cornrows. After Kelly hit her, Ronnie hit the cement. Roy, Lil' Jesse, and Nod leaped off of the porch and steps as a collective, landing blows and elbows and boots and spit and pain on top of Kelly's face and back. You see how I did his face? Lil' Jesse laughed at Kelly. Yo, look like that junkie off The Wire. The Wire? I asked. You watch that? Boy, that's the best fucking show that ever came out, he said. Of course I watch it. Are you stupid? And it wasn't on that day and not on that month. Maybe not even that year, but eventually I caught an episode of The Wire. The one where Avon Barksdale lost his mind because his West Side basketball team lost to some East Baltimore dudes. By the time I saw the show, The Wire had wrapped his final season. How could I have missed it? The characters played on a court where I played sometimes. Episodes navigated through blocks I lived near or moved through. I grew up with a bunch of Barksdales and bought with many of them over in Lafayette housing projects. My childhood friend, Andre Poole, AKA Silk, Baltimore's version of Allen Iverson, was the star of the basketball episode. How my city, my neighborhood, make it all the way to HBO and I totally missed it. After I watched that one episode, I went to a record shop called Soundgarden in Fells Point and brought the first couple of seasons. And for the first time, I binge watched a show. The first DVD went in and I didn't stop until I was done. Two years later, I became that annoying guy. Yo, you never watched The Wire? Are you crazy? An unofficial ambassador for David Simon's brand. And I didn't even think critically about the writing or the craft of the show. I just loved the hell out of it. I almost lost my life on a number of occasions. On top of the friends I lost, and federal indictments pulled me out of the streets. I wrote in college with the hopes of changing my life, and in that period, I fell in love with words. In 2014, I published an essay about how so many people in Baltimore were too poor for pop culture. It went viral, gaining me thousands of followers and a platform to share my writing. Almost instantly, I became a who's who to read in Baltimore. And into my inbox, in the sea of opportunity, offers, and praise, and hate mail, came an email from the Wire creator, David Simon. Great work, he told me. I wasn't the same kid from 2010 then, just a fan who loved the show. By this point, I had consumed all of Simon's work combed through his Baltimore Sun articles and read his books, The Corner and Homicide, twice. Getting a stamp from him meant the world to me. In Baltimore, it felt like a rite of passage, the legend reaching out to the rookie. If you ever need a writer, I'm free, I responded. Years later, I'm a New York Times bestselling author of three books, college professor, and feature storyline on The Slow Hustle, an HBO documentary about police corruption. One day, while I'm teaching a class at the University of Baltimore, 
I get a call from an unfamiliar number. During the break, I check my voicemail. It was David Simon. I hit him back and he told me that he and George Pelicanos were working on a new project and was considering me to join the writer's room. They invited me in and I got the gig. My real life and my community intersected with The Wire long before I met the people responsible for making it. And writing about my life and community had now brought me onto their team to build We Own This City. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be tackling the first episode of We Own This City with the actor who plays Wayne Jenkins, John Bernthal. But first, I want to dig a little into the opening scene of the show, which features Sergeant Wayne Jenkins giving a lecture to fellow police officers. I'm not here to talk to you about the fights that you have to have. See, I'm here to, uh, I'm here to talk to you about the ones that, you, know, you want to have. <laughs> and the ones you, you think you're entitled to just because you're wearing a badge. See, that, that's the real brutality. Thing is, you don't need that kind of brutality. And hey, not because it's not fun. Right? I get it. Get a few licks in on some mouthy asshole. Just can't shut the fuck up. I mean, come on. Fun is fun, right? Yeah. (laughs) But see, that kind of brutality, just, it only gets in the way of doing the job. To find out more about the importance of this scene and more, here are We Own This City executive producers and writers, George Pelicanos and David Simon, whose previous work includes The Wire, The Deuce, and Treme. The opening scene of the miniseries is Wayne Jenkins giving a speech or lecturing the cadets at the academy and talking about what is and what is not proper policing and how to get the best results and and how to treat the citizens. And as he's doing it, we see flashes of what's actually going on out on the street. Citizens in lower income neighborhoods primarily are being rounded up. They're being put into police vans. It's mass incarceration. We see them being marched into jail cells, marched in and out of court. And there's a disconnect between what Jenkins is is saying to them and what's actually going on. David wrote that scene, and it's a tour de force, I think. It really encapsulates everything about what we're trying to say about the show and also about the character of Jenkins. Jenkins is a guy who really believes, in a way, in what he's telling these cadets. And he's in denial of of who he is. Part of the fundamental problem is what the police department valued. They actually valued the kind of aggressive police work that allowed for this kind of um, corruption and this kind of uh, mission drift uh, into uh, brutality and and cynicism and uh, betrayal. These were the police they wanted, and they got them. And they heralded uh, people like Jenkins because they were producing stats. They were putting guns and dope on the table. And those were the metrics by which good police work uh, was measured in Baltimore and had been for generations. You have to arrest people, to be sure, but you have to make the right arrests. I mean, if you fail to do that, the city becomes more violent, more retributive in its violence, and there's less faith placed in the um, societal response to violence. So, you know, you become a, a city of 200 murders a year becomes a city of 330 or 350 murders a year, which is what happened in Baltimore. They were emphasizing the wrong things. So the idea that the that they would be letting the equivalent of Wayne Jenkins lecture their new officers said exactly what we mean to say about policing and what's happened to it under the drug war. These police officers we're talking about in the GTTF were doing home invasions, and most outrageously, they were seizing drugs and then selling them back out on the street. That's a huge leap from when we did the wire, the level of corruption. In fact, the the level of corruption on the GTTF was unprecedented in policing. You know, if you watch The Wire, you know, you saw Herc and Carver stuffing found money into their vests and keeping it. You had the premise of routine brutality and the idea that police might be taking the money if they were in a vice enforcement capacity that that found money might not all make it back to the evidence control unit. We understood those as elemental corruptions of their time. The cops who became the gun trace task force in Baltimore. Most of them were not cops at the time that we wrote the last words of the wire. And the Herks and the Carvers of the wire, the guys who were not trained in the, in the fundamentals of real police work were validated for again, dope and guns on the table for stats. 
and for numbers of arrests rather than quality of arrests. So what happened was they became the sergeants and lieutenants and they, they, they trained the next generation. And we're about two generations removed. If, if you think of it, a police career is usually about 20 years. We're about two generations removed from the wire. And now the guys who didn't have anybody over them who had any regard for police work, now they were training the next generation. As someone who shot and was on location 20 years ago and now returned to Baltimore to do this show, if anything, the, the conditions in the city have gotten worse and the, and the relationship between the police and the citizens has definitely gotten worse. For me, the first episode of We Own This City is all about the idea of the golden boy, specifically Sergeant Wayne Jenkins. He was everything the Baltimore Police Department wanted. Sharp, aggressive, a former MMA fighter, hungry to be good at his job. On the surface, it did seem as though Jenkins was good at his job. But underneath was widespread corruption and abuse that would shake the city to its core. The next person I want to hear from is the man himself, John Barenthal, whose credits include The Walking Dead, The Punisher, and King Richard, just to name a few. And we own a city, he plays Wayne Jenkins, a sergeant of the Baltimore Police Department who becomes a notorious central figure in a federal corruption case against the agency's gun trace task force. John Barenthal, welcome to the podcast. Man, D, it's an honor to be with you, man. Always an honor to be with you. Pleasures all mine, man. I just want to, I want to go back to the beginning. I want you to tell our viewers how you initially got involved with the project. As soon as I heard about this, this was uh, full force. I desperately wanted to be a part of it. To be honest, I can't think of a, a project that speaks more to the absolute dead on center of the things that I'm confused by, frustrated by, fascinated by, passionate about, angry about. Mm. And I sort of feel like at this time when this sort of thing came to me, when you talk about these issues of policing and race, and Baltimore, which is near to my home and near to my heart because I grew up in D.C. Right. Baltimore is a city now that's absolutely in my heart. I fell in love with so many people who I got to make this with. I fell in love with so many people who were courageous enough and open enough and generous enough to kind of share their stories with me along the way. And I'm a better man and I'm a better artist for it. So I'm just full of gratitude. It's something that I appreciate in all of my favorite artists is the ability to just be hyper-curious. Like you want to know. You have a hunger to know and understand. And I think it's so rare because we're living in a time where everybody picks a side. Mm. Everybody sees the side they identify with the most and then they jump on that side. And it doesn't mm. matter if their side is out kicking infants every Sunday morning. <laughs> if that's your side, that's your side. <laughs> we see it in business. We see it in Congress. We see it with iPhones and Androids. Like everyone mm. picks a side. But, I, you Absolutely. know, I was thinking, wow, John's the perfect person because John is intellectually curious on that journey to finding empathy. So um, one of the things that people who watch the show are going to want to know is about your research process because your research process was next level. Like people were like, <laughs> yo, where's John? John's in the middle of Middle River somewhere. Why not get him out of Middle River? But I think you, you nail it. And I, I want to know how. How did you get there? What did you have to know about Wayne to betray him the way you did? What's, what's, what's the secret? Talk about your research process. You know, I went three months early. I did ride-alongs in literally every district, from patrol all the way to what would be more equivalent to more aggressive unit, plainclothes gun squads, going out and being with people, literally taking guns off the street, going in and getting in high-speed pursuits, you know, doing all that. But it was also hanging out with the people that he sold drugs with, mm. understanding his commitment to his family and the juxtaposition there and the confusion there and the, the conflict there, understanding how he was viewed by other officers. And look, whenever you talk to somebody who's really experienced something and maybe has lost something or has been a victim to something, I think there's something sacred for them to then open up to you Absolutely. and for them to sort of be a part of you telling the story. There are no words for the victims whose Fourth Amendment rights were violated by this corruption and people who suffered far greater indignities than even that. 
But there's also something to say to the good men and women of the Baltimore Police Department who suffered by being in proximity to this guy. So I really wanted to hear from them. I wanted to hear from his best friends. I wanted to hear from the people that he grew up with. Mm -hmm. David Simon said right from the beginning, this doesn't work if we just create a monster. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work. Like, how do you get into, like, what made this man tick? He was a great father. He was uh, a committed husband. How did the system create the choices that he made. And that's not to relieve him in any way of his complicity or his guilt. It's a human yeah, because profession. because it's not that simple. It's not that It never is, man. It never is. Nothing is that simple. And I think with good projects, we can show that. And you got in pretty deep, man. A dude swung on you by Mondam and Ma, right? Yeah, yeah. In the middle of a take. Yes, sir. A dude thought you were really a guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. He did. But that means you were doing your job, though. You know, he did take that swing on me, but, you know, I saw it coming, and, 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 and you know, I got him first. And and um, that dude, you know, he got up, he gave me a big hug, dude. You know what I mean? He gave me a big hug. He's like, oh, you're a real one. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> That's how we was putting it down. He didn't even know. <laughs> you played this character, and you talk about empathy, right? And it's very important to you, not just from what I see the times I was around you, but when I hear stories about you, everyone talk about, oh, man, John's a great guy. You have a great reputation, right? Wayne had a great reputation with the people who he worked with, but he didn't, he had a horrible reputation with people in the city, the actual people he was supposed to be protecting. So as a guy who's naturally empathetic like you, and I'm not saying this just to say it, I sat at, with you at the restaurant and why'd you take a hundred photos in like one night? And I've been around celebrities who don't do that. How do you get into the mental headspace to be able to portray someone like that? How do you do it? Look, you and me have had many conversations about this quote-unquote war on drugs. Mm. And I think we're both unbelievably sort of committed to sort of investigating how unbelievably sinister and how many lives have been ruined right. on all sides of things by that war. There's just so much victimization from that war. But it was a war. And I think that, you know, when you look at a group of people that feel like they're on one side of things, the loyalty and the camaraderie, when you look at these police forces, especially these aggressive, plainclothes, flex squad units, the kind of policing that they were both encouraged to do and that they did, it inherently puts them in an unbelievably dangerous situation. So there's something that's created by a group of people that go into danger together where their metal is tested constantly and you are constantly looking at the person next to you and you're constantly like, hey man, if I go down this alley, are you going down with me? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something unbelievably not just corrupt, but just misguided and wrong and sinister about this idea of, hey, it's us versus them. Right. Because then we're asking these people to turn that on and off. And look, there are times when these guys need to turn that on. And I think there are times when we need people who are willing to take the fight to criminals. That's how we keep people safe. But going in with that mentality is enormously sinister and it leads to unbelievably bad choices being made. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's a time and place for it. And so what I can sort of like hook into is by going out enough with these guys, I really understood the love and the bond that they had for each other. And I understood that by being a guy that you can depend on in these movements, it doesn't matter what side of the law you're on, what side you play football with somebody. There are certain people who will roll with you. There are certain people who will go the distance with you. And I think Wayne came from a world, from Middle River, from the Marine Corps, and then into the Baltimore Police Department, where that kind of loyalty and that kind of camaraderie was celebrated. Right. You were judged by, would you be the kind of guy that would be there in a pinch? He was very much that guy. We can examine whether culturally that leads to corruption, whether that leads to bad choices, whether it leads to violence. That is an examination that needs to happen. But I think we also have to look at how part of that is needed. And I think that for me, you know, having the respect of his peers and being the kind of guy that could be counted on that was something that I took enormously seriously. And, I, you know, I was able to sort of like really examine that in the field, being out with these guys all the time. Man, let's get into this Baltimore accent. <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you learn your Baltimore accent? Yeah, I worked with a wonderful dialect coach, but for me, I, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to get it as close to Wayne's as possible. I wanted to get that kind of Middle River thing down. Mm -hmm. But I also, you know, the whole timber of his voice is much higher. But for me, what was kind of more important than just the sound or the sound quality of it was he had this unbelievable ability to code switch. Oh my God, yeah, he was a code switching master. They used to say that he would get 
phones off of people that he was arresting or that he was talking to and he would put their number in their phone and then he would call them back pretending to be a friend and he could get them to meet them somewhere to make a sale right and he would then arrest them and he would get off on being able to talk quote unquote black and he would talk certain way with white officers that he would with black officers and then on the streets and look he was a hip-hop kid like that's what he listened to and i think he used that there's no question all good police say the same thing it's not about going out there and you know whooping on people like that's not going to get you where you need to get you know you have to be able to get information out of people you need to be able to talk you need to get people to set people at ease and i noticed just through countless hours of body cam video with wayne how he would talk to people and and how he would use courtesy and he would use it as a technique and as a weapon he was just constantly shifting all over the place you show us that in a really really important way in that speech that opens up the series it's so good. Oh, thanks, man. It's a powerful moment. What does that speech and that scene symbolize for you? I think a lot. It was the first thing that we shot. It was like a six-page monologue, you know? And I think the thing with Wayne that's so interesting is he really believes it. I think still to this day, you know, I, you know, I've talked to him from prison, and I, I, th I think to this day, he still can't kind of believe how all of this went down. I think he still considers himself to be one of the best police officers of all time. You mean he can't believe that he's in jail? Can't believe it. Can't believe it and thinks it's wrong. That's crazy. Because I went to his hearings and I went to the trial uh -huh. and I sat in the stands and I watched this man cry and apologize and apologize and cry. How do you go from that? And it wasn't a performance. Like, they, he's not you. He can't act like you. He, he doesn't have your skills. <laughs> these were real, these were real fat, chunky tears. Yep. And then you go in jail and you sit for a minute and you think about it and then you, you move into that different space. Well, I think where he's come to is that he sees this in its totality, that it was this system. It was this system in place and he was rewarded for doing the things okay. he was doing. Because look, I mean, if you look at his sort of behavior in the uprising and the the reaction to the officers and Freddie Gray. He was there and he went and he was pulling officers off the street and, and you could look at his actions that day and they were heroic. Like he stepped up and he did that. But then later on that night, he looted a, a Rite Aid and he looted a bunch of Oxycontin, right? It's the same guy. What do you think was his, like the main force behind why that happened? Was it the power? Was it the greed? Was it the money? Was it a mix? And getting swept up, I think it's a mix of all of it, but I think the way that Wayne looked at it is that in any other profession, if you were at the top of the top, if you were an elite lawyer, if you're an elite basketball player, if you're going above and beyond, you should be rewarded for it financially, with perks. And I think the way that he felt was he was putting his life at risk for this city in a way that no one else was. He was sitting there being rewarded with medals and with accolades and with this freedom to kind of go wherever he wanted because he was putting up those numbers. So he started putting up those numbers by all means necessary. And what he felt is that he should have been compensated for it. Now, I can't get behind that. Right. I believe in the good people in the Baltimore Police Department. They took a code of being a, a peacekeeper. Most of them came from the community, and most of them realized that, man, it ain't about all that. It's like their reward is helping out a kid. Their reward is getting somebody off the street. But you and I both know, man, it's like when you look at what you're doing every day is that you're in a war, you don't look at it that way. And his thing was, I don't know if I'm going to come home to my kids every night, so I deserve more compensation, so I'm just going to go take. I, I got a homeboy named Jerry, right? He's in real estate. He makes a decent amount of money, and we were kids— he always wanted to be a trash man. Even sometimes he'd wake up in the morning and he'd hear the trash truck coming down the alley and he'd run out and he'd grab the bag of trash and he'd ask the trash man, hey, can you let me throw it in? <laughs> and they would be like, sure, young man. And he would <laughs> throw it in and he was like, damn, man, I got to throw it in there again this week, right? Yeah. But he got into real estate to make a lot of money because the trash man job didn't pay what he wanted to make. That's right. Wayne, you're not Batman. Nobody <laughs> told you to be a cop. You know, they Straight tell you up. what they pay off the rip. That's right. It's no secret. They tell you what they pay. So I understand where you're coming from. And I understand how, you know, a lot of us feel like, arguably, I've been overpaid for some things, but I feel mm. like I'm underpaid at everything I do based mm -hmm. on the amount of effort that I put in. Mm -hmm. If the job is an hour, I spend 20 hours making sure I get that hour right, right? That's right. So it's a wild conversation to have. And you, you know, you one thing you did that I like is you spend time in the community, you spend time around the city, you spend time with police officers. And you got a chance to incorporate nuance into how you took on the role. 
I want to know what has happened to your perspective on policing. Has it evolved in a positive way? Has it become more negative? Are you in the same space? Like, What has changed since you got a chance to spend that time with those people, those ride-alongs? Man, it's changed a ton. I mean, I think just like anything else, the more you know something, the more you understand something, the more you, you actually rub shoulders with people, look them in the eye and share meals with them. Things to me, often become more complicated, not less. They become more nuanced, not less. They become richer. We have this tendency to just stay on the poles. We have this tendency to wave our flag and say, hey, I'm on this side or I'm on this side. Mm -hmm. Look, in my life, I've been detained by the police. I've been locked up. I've been beaten by the police. I think that, you know, during the fervor of this last year, last couple of years, I found myself sort of in a tricky position because, you know, with everything in this movement that was really sweeping up the country, I wanted to be a part of it. You know, I was outraged. I also have dear, dear, dear friends that I really believe in that are on the force. I think I went into this thing really looking at how fear on the street mm -hmm. and judgment and going in with sort of like a preconceived notion of people, how that's the enemy and it causes so much heartbreak and tragedy and and you've got these fearful people out there and i saw that i'm not gonna lie i saw that i saw people in the baltimore police department that were operating with fear mm -hmm. but i also saw people in the baltimore police department that had no respect for those people and who checked those people and i saw people that were unbelievably courageous and had the presence of mind and heart and intellect that they police with empathy that they understand that this is not about taking things personally that if somebody's running from you they're not running from you they're running from the badge mm. and i've met and hung out with people uh, in the baltimore police department that i truly believe would stand up and would not let this kind of corruption and this kind of uh, brutality take place but i i also saw people that i think would stand by that didn't have that kind of courage so i, I mean look it's a human profession right i think that my insight to it it just got richer and more complicated i don't know that i have any big answers it's it, it comes down to the individual I, I walked away with people that i will love and respect um in the community for the rest of my life and i will walk away with people from the baltimore police department that i will love and respect for the rest of my life what was your time like in Baltimore? What was the city like for you? Man, I loved it. You know, it's crazy because growing up in D.C., you're so close, but culturally, it just seems like an ocean away. I never really mess with Baltimore that much, you know, and that city is just right in the middle of the center of my heart now. I fell in love with it in every way. And, you know, we would go out and go on these raids and these ride-alongs, mm -hmm. these bonding sort of experiences. And the crazy thing was for me is that, I'll be honest with you, when I was doing this show, I wasn't really looking to hang out with the other actors. And I, I love them. There was nothing against right. them. There was something about having those experiences with those guys, with those men, mm -hmm. that... I wanted to be at the bar with them. I wanted to get back out on the streets with them. I would work 16-hour days and then be like, yo, Dre, let's get back to the Southwest. Let's go out with Nagovich. Let's go out with Maggio. Let's go. Yo, you got to tell a story about you and Josh Charles on a ride along. We went out with the gun crew from the Southwest and at the end of the, <laughs> and then at the end of the <laughs> night, you know, we were driving back to the station. I saw this guy on the corner in a driveway with a bunch of people kind of hanging out and he had like a big long rifle with him. And, you know, that's really what they're there to do is to try to get guns. And I was just like, gun. And, you know, we went screaming up into this driveway and, and <laughs> Josh, like, my dad, he's holding on to me. Yeah, man, they was just a BB. They were shooting rats, man. It wasn't no big thing, man. Right. He did have another gun right. on him, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was something. <laughs> but then, like, that night, one of the people that they're with lost a dog that night. And so I went with them to go find their dog. Yo, that's so random. <laughs> it is random, but, like, that's it's the beautiful. thing. It's beautiful. Like, it's beautiful, What though. is it's more important? Though. Like, what is more important? Getting that BB gun off the street or, like, going and finding that dog that like ran away because we rolled up there that way because that's somebody's baby right. like that woman loved that dog and they were freaking out about it did y'all find it we did find it and i think the thing is oh, i was like we're okay. not leaving until we find the dog you know what i'm saying and we did that and a lot of these officers were like dope right. let's go find the dog some of them were like hey man what are you doing who cares about that dog you know and it's this us versus them mentality that i just can't get down with that is the argument 100 percent. nothing is simple everything no. is complex that's right so for every trash man who let the homie throw a bag in that's right there's another trash man who's like kid get the fuck out of here get out of here man we gotta dog. work that's I, it I'm, yeah i'm <laughs> 
And so, and that's, that's it. And that's the game. That's it. I really do believe that where we do need to find and locate and examine and honestly get rid of these police officers with this us versus them attitude, we also need to celebrate the ones because there was a lot of those guys who were like, this is great. Let's go find the dog. And they loved being able to deliver that dog back. It meant something to them. What do you want people who watch this show to take away? Hmm. There are so many folks in this country that the opportunity landscape is, it's barren, man. And that can be pawns in a system and can have their very freedoms taken from them in an instant, just to be a number, just because somebody feels something. Absolutely. What, what's so important about, you know, really examining a system is that the system has a profound influence on the individual. It's not about saying this guy's a good guy, this guy's a bad guy, that guy did this, that guy did this. We have to look at the system. And, you, you know, when you think about policing, the amount of power that a policeman yields on the street is staggering. They have the power to take your freedom mm -hmm. away, the power to take your life away. So it's vital. Mm -hmm. The only way that we are going to get those folks off is we have to create a culture of policing where people don't want to be a part of that anymore and where community police are celebrated. When I say community police, it's not just, I mean people from the community, people who have love for the community that they police, who love for the people that they're with, that have real relationships that are fostered in that community. I think that's the takeaway, if that makes sense. I think a lot of cops are going to watch this show and they're going to be hot, man. They're going to be upset. But then I think a lot of cops are going to watch the show and they're going to be energized. They're going to examine themselves and wonder if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yep. What do you think that's going to look like? I really hope and believe in the second group, the absolutely sort of like unbending scrutiny on policing, the most sort of uh, brutal and honest scrutiny on policing that I heard while I was down there were from other cops, man that were from other cops saying, man, this shit is rotten. Like, you see that shit? You see what this dude is doing right here? Like, I just, again, like, I hope we can look at those people, hold them up, shine a light on them. And if you're angry about it, if you see something that you do as a police officer in this, if you're angry, you should ask yourself why. And, and maybe it's because we're telling the truth. Beautiful, man. You outdid yourself, man. It's, it's, it's a special project, and I, it wouldn't be the same if you didn't commit as much. Thanks, bro. From going deep into the trenches to your subject's neighborhood, his family, his co-workers, his friends. I think that's something we need to celebrate because we couldn't get the story done the way it needed to be done unless you did what you needed to do. So I appreciate it. We love you. We're thankful. Love you too, bro. Anytime you're in Baltimore, you know you got somewhere to stay. Yeah, man, back at you, man. This has got you all over it, bro. This could not be done without you, man. So huge love, man, and eternal respect. And love to you and the family, bro. Thanks for listening to the official We Own This City podcast. And a special thank you to our guests, George Pelicanos, David Simon, and John Barenthal. We Own This City airs on HBO Monday night. And our next episode comes out on May 2nd. i see you then. This is the official We Own This City Companion podcast, hosted by Dee Watkins, and it's a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Our senior producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our consulting producer is Carrie Antholas. Maria Robbins Somerville is our associate producer. Aaron Kelly is our managing producer. Darby Maloney is our editor. And our engineer is Hannes Brown. Our executive producers are Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss-Berman. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch episodes of We Own This City on HBO Max. Until next time.